How's everybody tonight? Welcome to our new clinic here in Northbridge. Um, we're part of Milford Regional Medical Center, uh, Rehab and Sports Medicine. If you don't know, we were located down at um, Granite Street at the Medical Center. Um, that building is now empty. We, that housed um, us, Lab, X-Ray, and Tri-County, and um, Blackstone Valley OBGYN, and we are now all housed here in this uh, nice building. So uh, we've been here for about four weeks, um, and we love our space. After tonight's lecture, if some of you haven't been here before, I'd be happy to give you a tour of our side. Um, my name is Teresa Ryan. I'm a physical therapist by profession. I am the supervisor here uh, in Northbridge. This is Cheryl Nowicki and Amanda um, Bourgeois. She will, they will be giving the lecture with me tonight on my aching back. Um, I have been a physical therapist for 29 years. I've been the supervisor here for four and a half years. I've worked for Milford for 12 years. Here at our facility, we have eight physical therapists. We have three occupational therapists. We have a speech therapist. We have two clinical aides. We have an on-call clinical aide who right now has been working about 20 hours for us because we've been busy. And we have two wonderful rehab coordinators who if you call here, you'll speak to one of them. We, in this facility, treat back pain, all kinds of back pain. We treat athletes. We treat all kinds of sur uh, surgical patients. Uh, shoulders, total shoulders, rotator cuffs, labrum tears, decompressions. We treat hips, surgical hips, regular hips. Uh, we treat knees, any kind of knee surgery, total knees, meniscus tears, arthritic knees, ACL surgeries, ankles. We treat vertigo. We have a pediatric program. We have a therapist who treats pediatrics with uh, children with de developmental delays. And on the tour, I'll show you, we have a pediatric gym. Uh, we have a lymphedema specialist that treats swelling from patients who have had surgery or um, cancer and has have radiation. Um, am I leaving out anything else? We treat neurological disorders, MS. Um, we treat amputees. You name it, um, we have a therapist who will treat it. <laughs> so we all have our little niches. And, uh, and we love to talk about it. So, and my family would tell you, yes, she does like to talk about it. <laughs> so, but tonight we're gonna, we're gonna um, just focus on back pain. And back pain um, can comprise a whole lot of things, but we're gonna talk about things very generally, all right? Because we could be here all night talking about it. So we're gonna start with um, Amanda first, and she's gonna talk to you about the anatomy uh, that's very important to understand initially, and then we'll go on from there, okay? Um, I graduated from UMass three years ago with my doctorate in physical therapy, and I've been um, working here since, and my um, interest is in um, athletes and, and sports, sports medicine. Um, so generally, uh, so we're gonna start out with a general um, overview of the muscles. And again, in a very general sense, um, to kind of build the foundation of, of, the, of the issues we're going to talk about um, down the road. So um, we broke the back muscles down into just a superficial category and a deep muscle. And there's a bunch of, a bunch of muscles in each category. Again, we're just talking about them very, very generally. Um, with the superficial muscles, um, they're more made up of just it's a group called your erector spinae, and they help um, extend and maintain the um, normal curvature of your spine. And again, so those are superficial. You've got tons of, tons of different muscles here. We're not going to go into detail. We just wanted to say that, that, um, um, that those help support the curvature of your spine. Um, deeper in, that's the picture on the right. Um, then you're going to start seeing these little guys running along this, this running along right um, bone to bone in your spine, um, and those are your multifidi and your rotatories primarily. Um, and again, they provide um, again they provide stability and stiffness. Um, but they, you know, what's special about them is that they kind of give feedback 
um, to the other bigger muscles on the left. And they just kind of um, tell them what's kind of going on and if they should kind of alter movement. And they monitor the positions um, of, the, of the whole spine. Um, and again, this will kind, of t we'll, we'll kind of bring this back into some of the issues and things that we see down the road and why these muscles are important to retrain and um, um, strengthen. And so I just talked about all of those. Um, so next, when we talk about the back, we also have to talk about the front. So the core muscles um, are primarily your rectus um, and your obliques and your transverse abdominis. And a lot of people, most of us have heard of our rectus and our external internal obliques, but not so much the transverse abdominis, and we kind of focus more on that here. Um, so your rectus is the big muscle. You've heard of people, you know, say, you say they're working on their six pack or whatever, that's their, that's their, that's the muscle that really flexes, bends your spine. So that's on the, on the right. Um, then on the sides, you have your internal and external obliques, and those help bend your abdomen side to side. And then deeper in, and then like I said, a lot of what we focus on is your transverse abdominis, because it's the only muscle that helps compress your spine. Um, it, it acts like a corset, and we don't, um, a lot of times that muscle gets sh shut off with injury, and we have to retrain that. And, and if, if it's the only muscle that compresses, then it's the only muscle that's really gonna act, again, like a corset to support your spine. So it's not so, mu not so important are the rectus and um, obliques when you injure, it's more importantly um, training your transverse abdominis. And, and when we talk about treatment, we'll, we'll get back to that too again. Um, so again, I talked about all those. So then next, when we talk about muscles, we have to talk about the muscles that are around your hip because those are very, those tie in again to your back and they're very important. Um, so we don't just focus on the back, we focus on the whole package, front to back, hip, side to side. Um, and so those are your glutes, your iliopsoas, your quadratus lumbor lumborum, your piriformis muscle. Um, and again, briefly, what does your glutes do? They help support your pelvis and your back on top of your femur. So they really, so they do a lot in extending your legs, bringing your legs back. The femur is right here. So that's femur, and then again, femur, femur, and those are all your glutes. <clears throat> and you have different parts of your glutes. A glute med, a glute max, a glute minimus. Those aren't super important. Just know that that's a group of muscles that help support your spine too. Um, iliopsoas, um, that's the muscle in the, that attaches to your spine, but it kind of comes, people think of it, we think of it more in the front, but it does start in your spine and kind of come forward a little bit. It helps to raise, raise your body to get out of bed. It is important lifting your leg up towards your body. Um, your quadratus lumborum, that's the one on the bottom right. So that's helping to bend, bend your back sideways. And then last but not least, your piriformis. Um, and that does a couple different things. So not to you know, get caught up on you know, movements and, and things like that, but it, in certain positions it'll either help um, flex this, um, it'll help internally rotate or it'll help externally rotate, depending on if you're flexed or not. And again, that's not super important, but just know that it has different functions. And again, that's everything there. So that was a brief, really brief general view, uh, overview of the spine, uh, the muscles of the spine. And so now we kind of move to nerves, and we just want to give, again, a general, general overview of the nerves. So, we have 31 pairs of nerves that exit the spinal cord. You can kind of see our model over here, and this gives you an idea, too, of all the nerves. So at each level, you have nerves that come out of the spinal cord and come out. And they come out, they exit out of, 
out of your vertebrae, out of the little holes on the side are called foramen. And they exit out and they travel to different parts and different muscles of your body. Um, and so, because we're talking about low back, we're focused more on the lower part of the spine and the nerves down there. Um, but in total, you have 31 pairs of nerves. Um, the lower spinal nerves angle downward. And if you've ever heard of that cauda equina, that's what, because it all kind of starts looking like a horse's tail as you get down on the low part of the back. Um, and then the big sciatic nerve, and you can see that the bottom on the left and right, labeled on the left, um, it exits the spinal column through an opening in the pelvis called your sciatic um, foramen. Okay, and then we'll, we will kind of get more into that a little bit too. Um, generally with the bones, they're broken down into different sections, your cervical, thoracic, lumbar. We're focused more on the lumbar. You've got your five um, lumbar vertebrae. The picture on the right is showing you um, a top angle on the top um, of a vertebrae, and the, and the bottom one is showing you just the side angle to give you, it, you know, it's a very complex, complicated bone, and it's got a lot of different shapes and contours and different joints. There's multifaceted um, joints involved. Um, so it's a lot. It's a lot going on, and the idea is to just show you that the back is very, very com complex. Um, so the lumbar nerves and the lumbar intervertebral foramen, they change in size from level to level, and they're not equal. Um, so again, that's, that, that's the, the hole, if you will, the joint space that's formed by two vertebrae where the nerves come out. Those are not all equal in size. And it, you can't, it's not, um, can't quite see it too distinctly on that, but um, the, key, the key to this is um, to tell you that the L5 is the smallest intervertebral space. You have that smallest hole, if you will, but it has the largest nerve coming out of it. So that last vertebrae in your spine has, has a big nerve coming out of it and just a little space. So it ha the nerve has enough room to travel through it, but the, but the point is that it doesn't leave much room for error. And this is where a lot of problems happen. So again, it, it has an you have an increased chance of compression by pathology just because of how big it is and how small the whole, how tight the space is. Stenosis, yeah, it's a similar, it, it's, it's an idea, it, it's a concept that, right, the, the space is becoming smaller because of arthritic changes. So similar in that idea that you have less space now. But generally, normal anatomy, you, that last nerve just has smaller space to begin with. So right, then if you get a stenosis and you have arthritic changes, then you're making that space smaller and smaller and you potentially can cause problems. So I'm Cheryl Nowicki, I'm a physical therapist here, and uh, I've been here just over five years, and I've been a PT over 22 years. So what I'm gonna talk about today is kind of three diagnoses or three things um, that we see coming through the door. We get scripts from the doctor. Um, so the first one we're gonna, uh, I'll tell you the three are sciatica, disc herniation, and piriformis syndrome. So I'm gonna go into more detail on each of them. So we're gonna start with the, um, with sciatica, oh, there we go. <laughs> um, okay, so the, the important thing to note is that sciatica is not a diagnosis, it, it, it's a symptom. So um, the sciatic nerve, as Amanda already uh, discussed, comes down um, through that sciatic foramen and from the low back into the hip, into the buttock, and down the leg. So you can, you can get a pinched nerve. Um, so sciatica just describes it's a symptom. It, it's not really describing what's truly going on. Um, so sciatica can be that pain radiating down the leg. Um, and you can get it starting from the low back, hip, and buttock area. Um, it typically affects one side, but you can get sciatica on both sides. Um, okay. The causes of sciatica um, 
can be, so we're gonna get into more, this is more of diagnosis of what's causing sciatica, um, can be caused by a herniated disc, which I'll go over in a little bit exactly what that means. Um, it can be caused by osteoarthritic bone spurs um, that are compressing uh, or pinching along the distribution of that sciatic nerve. Um, it can be caused by a uh, sprain or a strain of the muscles in that area, because there's a lot of musculature in that area. Um, or just a generalized inflammation of the nerve uh, or the surrounding tissue. Okay, so the next topic is an actual diagnosis, which is the actual um, ruptured or herniated disc. And th these terms, when we get them, tend to be inter interchangeable by the doctors. Um, but there's actually, there, I'll show in the next slide, it's, there's a progression um, that, so they're not exactly interchangeable. So um, on this slide, you can see what a normal disc looks like. So um, here you have the vertebra, and this is an, um, basically the discs are nice like little cushions. You can think of it, I'm going to show you in a minute, like a jelly donut. So it's nice and complete. It's, you know, all together. The jelly's in there. It's intact. Um, and then you get your herniated disc where you can see the wall is kind of blown out a little bit and um, that fluid is starting to try to leak out a little bit. Um, so really, there, like I said, there's this progression that goes on. And so... Um, you know, you can get the bulging, which is just, you can see the wall is just coming out a little bit. And then the next stage of that is more what you hear, that herniated disc, um, which is a little bit more bulging. That fluid is starting to really start to squish out, but it's still contained in that wall space of the disc. Um, and then the next phase would be when you hear about a ruptured disc, that's where the wall actually comes undone. So the, um, the, the fluid is starting to leak out from the disc itself. And then the fourth stage is you've, re you've fragmented the disc, so it's leaking out, okay? Um, so let me... So I have my little visual here. What's that? Um, I think I... I'm trying. So <laughs> I brought jelly donuts. <laughs> I only brought two, sorry. Um, but so what I wanted to show you, this is the nice intact disc. Can, I know, is it hard to see? I'm sorry. All right. So we have our nice intact disc there. Tip it a little bit. And then this one, you can see that it's starting to leak out a little bit in a little bit of compression, and it's really starting to leak out the jelly. Okay, so you'll never think of a jelly donut again the same way. But that's, our, our discs are very, very similar it's a good analogy. <laughs> they did. And I've always hated jelly donuts, and now I really hate them. So. Um, so the causes of a ruptured or herniated disc. So that's before, you know, this is when you're getting herniated or the bulging is when it's still intact in there. Um, and it can be caused by um, spinal discs can be be damaged by injury or trauma, um, so a sudden heavy strain or increased pressure to the low back. So if you go to lift something that's excessively heavy or you're holding your breath and straining, the, that can cause uh, a disc to actually herniate. Uh, repetitive activities can, can cause it. Um, over time, poor posture and biomechanics, so doing lifting the incorrect way, sitting in poor postures over time. Eventually, I tell all my patients, you know, back pain is, is it, it's not usually one thing that causes it. It's typically cumulative. So everyone said, all I did was bend down and pick something up. Well, that was the straw that literally broke the camel's back. So, um, but typically, um, a lot of times we see it as part of normal wear and tear. So typically the disc disease can begin as early as between the ages of 35 and 45. So you're only like halfway through your work career and you can end up starting to have problems. Um, and it can be caused already from degenerative changes uh, to the vertebra. Um, you can start getting loss of disc fluid. Uh, and you can get, start getting fibrotic changes, so that just means that um, the surrounding supportive tissue starts to like harden and, and not have a lot of that elasticity and give to it anymore. It's starting to just not, um, it's starting to kind of, you can get some fraying and that sort of thing. Um, people with physical jobs are more prone to disc herniation. Um, 
because obviously they're doing a lot of lifting and repetitive activities. And then people who drive for long periods of time because they're sitting and it's hard to maintain those good postures day after day. Um, and heavy machinery, that constant vibration can also be, um, can cause the, um, the, all the surrounding tissues to become impacted. Okay. So what happens when a disc herniates or ruptures? So if you're just having a disc bulge or herniation, um, so it hasn't leaked through yet, there's still that wall's intact, but it's just kind of poking a little bit, you may or may not have symptoms. You might not even know that your disc is bulging or, or herniated. Um, you may just have localized inflammation going around because your body senses that there's something going on and our bodies like to try to protect itself. So you may get inflammation that are actually mimicking the symptoms. So, you know, there's no need to panic kind of thing. That's where PT can kind of come in um, and hopefully save the day <laughs> to, to bring in and help support the area so that it doesn't become ruptured. Um, and then if you do end up with a disc that breaks open or ruptures, that's typically when you have the pain, numbness, weakness, and tingling that goes on. Um, you hear about radiating symptoms. Uh, and that's because our nerves carry not only, um, it, you know, our nerves supply how we move function, but also sensory. And that's why you might hear about pins and needles or burning. That's typically nerve symptoms. Um, so that disc fluid is, it can be leaking out and pressing on the nerve roots. Okay, and th this slide is just very interesting. It's just the kind of, you can see what just daily activities and, and things that you're doing, how much that in can increase the disc pressure at L3. L3 is um, the area in our spine that has the most amount of mobility. That's kind of where we do a lot of our rotation, bending, comes a lot from that area. So what's interesting to note is um, the bending forward. Um, so just bending forward with your legs straight, you're increasing that disc pressure by 150%, which is why we work so much on how to lift correctly or how to bend correctly, because that's not the right way to bend. <laughs> so you're just putting yourself more at risk. The other thing to note is if you're lifting with your back straight, but you're bending your knees, you still have a lot of pressure in there at 73%, but if you bend forward with your knees straight, it goes up to 169%, so oh, more than twice the amount of compression forces at L3. So that's why proper um, biomechanics, proper ways of lifting and bending are so important, and that's, Terry will go over that in a bit with treatment, but that's what we can educate you and, and, and work with you on that. Okay, so the other sim, um, diagnosis that we uh, get coming in the door and some of you may or may not have heard of is piriform, piriformis syndrome. And Amanda went over the anatomy a little bit. So it's an actual muscle um, that, um, that fan-like muscle that goes across your buttock. Um, you have it on either side, obviously. And then your sciatic nerve runs under that muscle. So um, the, the piriformis itself being a muscle can spasm. It can, you can get a bleed in there so you can fall and get a hematoma or a bruise in there, uh, can become swollen um, due to injury. So typically the symptoms of piriformis, um, you get more of a dull ache that's localized to that area, um, but you can get that sciatica, um, that, that symptom that I had talked about earlier, uh, because that sciatic nerve runs under the muscle, and if that becomes inflamed um, or you have a bleed in there or whatnot, you're compressing, you can be compressing on that nerve, so you, get, you can get those similar symptoms of sciatica. Um, typically, you have more pain when you're walking up inclines or stairs because you're um, contracting that muscle, um, and you can get increased pain after prolonged sitting because you're sitting on that muscle, so any prolonged sitting, you're compressing in that area as well. Um, and if, some, if you tend to be a side sitter, um, you're putting more pressure through that area. Um, and just overall decreased range of motion in the hip joint when you have piriformis syndrome because it, you're in pain, so you don't move as well. Um, all right. So those, those are, like, like I said, three of the kind of main low back diagnosis we see, but we see everything. And sometimes we just get low back pain coming through the door. But our job is to assess it and try to come up with the best treatment plan based on our assessment. Um, so Terry's gonna talk more about treatment options for back pain. All right, so here I am 
I'm going to talk about treatments of low back pain um, with physical therapy. So, um, when there's so many different treatments, and what we do as physical therapists is, you know, we look at what Amanda and Cheryl talked about. You'll come to physical therapy with a diagnosis. Sometimes it's just low back pain. It will be the diagnosis that you have. It's our job to evaluate you. We'll take your history. We'll listen to how your back pain came about. Sometimes people will tell us that I've had it for a year. I don't know how it came on. It was just gradual. That's the common thing is people will tell us that's just gradual. Um, we'll listen to what you say. We'll do a course of things that look at your range of motion very carefully. We'll muscle test all those muscles that um, Amanda talked about and Cheryl talked about. I'll talk a little bit about to see if they're weak, to see if they're tight. Lots of times you'll have a muscle imbalance. And then we come up with a specific plan for the, for the particular person, specifically for the person. There is no cookie cutter way to treat somebody. What, what will work for you won't work for your neighbor. What will work for you won't work for your friend because everybody's a little bit different in, in how their body moves and what's required of your body throughout the day. Um, and, and what you have going on in your body. Some people have diabetes, uh, some people have um, other things going on in their body, and that all physiologically is going to affect how you recover and how your muscles are going to um, kind of accept the physical therapy and work from there. Some people will get better in four weeks, and some people are going to get better in 12 weeks. So there is. Um, I know I use this phrase very often, and Cheryl laughs at me when she first came to work here. I, I say this, I say, you know, it's like peeling away an onion, right? So you, we take it and we like, we're constantly kind of peeling away all the things that bother you until we get to the root of what is actually causing your back pain and then give you the skills and when you leave here to be able to manage that, whether it's a home program, whether it's posture, body mechanics, so you yourself can deal with that at home. That's our job, to evaluate you, to get a specific program going for you, decrease your inflammation, make you stronger, and then educate you on how you can take care of yourself. So research supports um, conservative management. Conservative management uh, for low back pain versus surgical. I think that's the biggest thing that people are afraid of. Is that not what people are afraid of, that when they have back pain that I'm going to need surgery? Conservative management, especially in the early stage onset of 6 to 12 weeks, continues to be shown to be effective treatment in sciatica, disc herniation, and piriformis syndrome. I think the scariest thing for people is that they don't, like right when the back pain starts, is they don't get the help they need. They just think it's good. I think for any diagnosis, they think it's going to go away. Um, but conservative management will get you better quicker. Um, this can include medications, injections, physical therapy, osteopathic care, or even chiropractic care. Of course, I'm a big believer in physical therapy. Um, but sometimes these things can actually work together very well. Uh, treatment is always specific to the person, as I just talked about. Um, I don't have to say it again, but you may have the same diagnosis, but other factors in your life, emotionally, physically, um, may change that treatment course even slightly. Um, and every treatment is individualized. If, if it's not, then it's not a good treatment for you. Treatment techniques often used in physical therapy. I'm just touching on a few. Physical therapy is, is so immense that, you know, there's so many different techniques that we use to make you better. I have, I have therapists that here that um, have some certifications in spine treatment um, that, you know, I can't even begin to list here. You would be here all night. Um, listening to different techniques, but we're just going to touch upon the very basics that you would, um, which, which you would encounter. When treating any diagnosis, especially pain, you want to use a combination um, of, of things. You don't, you, generally we don't just use one thing. We usually use a combination of, of techniques to, to complement one another. 
Um, so exercises, those are meant to strengthen the core muscles that are going to stabilize your back. Um, we're going to stretch those muscles that get too tight. Usually, you know, the front muscles are going to get too tight because we sit and we protect ourselves. Um, we use manual therapy techniques, um, and we'll talk about what manual therapy techniques mean to you. Um, we use modalities, and I'll talk about what modalities mean to you. Posture and body mechanic education, and those are all getting us back to um, action in our lives, whatever that means. And that's another thing. We want to specifically ask you, what is your goal? Because what your goal to get back to life is might not be what anybody else's goal is, okay? Some people want to walk four miles, and some people just want to be able to go up and down the stairs, okay? So, all right. Strengthening. Strengthening is you're exercising specific muscle groups, which will help to support your spine. Amanda touched upon that a little bit. There's like little itty bitty muscles in your back that we want to support that are going to keep that spine nice and straight. They're going to minimize the stress on the little ligaments and the tendons that are surrounding your spine. Those little ligaments are going to inflame. They're going to they, those little ligaments are all like in here, okay? Those are going to inflame. Those are going to make the, the nerve root all cranky and irritated. So we want to minimize that by strengthening the, the muscles here and in the front. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Pain relief through exercise is attained by keeping your spine in good alignment. We want that spine to be in nice, perfect alignment. We do that through exercise, and then that will facilitate normal movement. Together, that decreases your chances of injury, okay? If you're moving normally, if, if you're moving normally and um, you're not in a funny position or walking abnormally, then you're decreasing your inflammation and the wearing and tear on the nerve, the discs and the nerve roots in your joints. Um, and then you're not getting as much inflammation around all those soft tissues and your discs and, and thus the nerve roots. Um, today in physical therapy, I know 29 years ago, physical therapy when I graduated was totally different. Um, I learned a very overall approach in college. That's how I came out, but it was very different when I got out into the field of outpatient. The, the doctor would write a script, hot pack exercise ultrasound. Like, that's what they wanted us to do. Today, we get a script from a doctor that says, evaluate and treat the patient, which is wonderful because we have an overall approach to treating our patients. The overall approach for back patients is, you know, going to the core, all right? You want to, we strengthen these core muscles in here. They're nice and deep. Um, we, we go to several of the muscles in your, in your low back. Um, your quadratus muscle is, is located back here. It gets tight. I mean, how many of us are just always like, oh, this is so tight back here. Your quadratus muscle gets tight. Um, your abdomen, we work on your, you know, stretching out your abdomen. Years ago, when I was in school in physical education, we did crunches. Like, how many of you like did crunches? And all you're doing here is you're just tightening this muscle right here. And then that just pulls you forward, putting more stress on your back. So now we have a whole different approach. Um, your glutes, as Amanda talked about, um, are one of the strongest muscles in your body, and we don't exercise those enough. So we take that approach. Um, and any of the, your lower quadrant, um, hips, um, muscle groups, we stretch and we balance them all out. These muscles are so important to your overall core. We, Everywhere in the media, they talk about core, core, core. And how many of you are like, what the heck is my core? <laughs> now you know what the core is. The core is from you know, here to here. And we look at your core, and we decide what, it, what, is, what do you need. So the goals of your exercises, all right? So we break them down. And we break down what's the most important. Your extensors, the, these are used to keep your back straightened and extend the spine, and that's for, you know, just standing up straight, doing any amount of lifting. And lifting can be anything. It can be, you know, groceries to lifting in the gym. Flexors. Um, flexors are what um, 
keep us, to allow us to bend our spine forward and then just supporting the spine in the front. These control how much of an arch we have in our back, known as, mostly of your lumbar spine. Now your lumbar spine is this right here, okay? And then you have your thoracic spine, as Amanda pointed out, in your cervical spine. Now, your iliopsoas, most people don't even pay attention to it. My patients know it well because I dig in nice and, nice and deep in here to release that psoas, and that psoas is deep in here, and it goes all the way back to your back, okay? And that gets tight, so we need to work on that. Your obliques, we work on those because those stabilize your spine when you're upright, and those rotate to help you maintain your proper posture. All these exercises, they help to restore proper balance. If you're tight in one muscle and you're, and you're, over, you're weak in another muscle, then, then you're off balance. So we evaluate you to make sure that what's tight over here, what's weak over here, and we balance you out. Now I'm a firm believer in that, you know, I don't send my patients home with, this sounds like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna have like 100 million exercises. But I'm a firm believer in like, picking and choosing the most important exercises so that they get done, you know, so that patients don't have, you know, 20 exercises to do, but the most important exercises. And some of them actually you can incorporate in your day's, day's um, work. Stretching. Stretching is important. This type of exercise targets the muscles that are inflexible, all right? Believe it or not, sometimes I say to my patients, so what feels tight? And they don't know what tightness means. So tightness is when something pulls, when you can't get your full range of motion of, of your joint, of your, of your leg, of your hip, of your back. Um, tightness and inflexibility can cause pain and irritation around your disc and your nerve root. I think the most common thing um, that I see is piriformis syndrome and the fact that if your piriformis is tight, and it's, it's inflexible, then it will, over the sciatic notch um, or the foramen, it gets tight and then it, the sciatic nerve just gets really irritated because it's just being constantly squeezed and, um, and then inflamed. So then you get sciatica. And, and part of our job is to figure out, is your sciatic nerve being irritated from up in your back or is it being irritated from tightness in your piriformis? Most common tight muscles that irritate the back, as we discussed earlier, are your quadratus, your glutes, your piriformis, the hamstrings, which I think probably everybody goes, oh my gosh, my hamstrings are tight, um, and the hip flexors, because we, we sit almost, you know, our whole life is that we sit, we sit at a desk, we, we're bending forward, most of us will have bad posture, so our hip flexors get really tight, so um, we'll kind of tend to bend forward a little bit, which puts a lot of stress on our back. Um, so these, ex so the, these exercises that we give, the stretching exercises, are the key to muscle balancing for optimal results in, in treating your, your aching back. So manual therapy. Um, anybody ever have any physical therapy and had like a hands-on approach? <coughs> Never. Oh, there you go. <laughs> There you go. Okay, so manual therapy. This is probably one of my most favorite um, parts of being a physical therapist. I love, I mean, I, I, obviously I give out exercises, but I love um, doing manual therapy. It's one of my special um, things that I do. Manual therapy is a special, specialized form of physical therapy delivered with the hands. Um, hands and fingers are utilized to apply certain pressure through, through your tissues, through your muscles, or trigger points or to manipulate joints. Um, manual therapy goals are, they help to decrease muscle spasm, decrease the tension uh, in, in joint dysfunction, and then, because when you do that, you then will decrease pain. So in the back, we will do um, some deep tissue release to, say, your, your quadratus. Uh, we can do some gentle joint mobilization to your spine. Um, trigger point therapy to the piriformis. And um, when I get into the modalities, we'll show you some of the little 
um, other things that we use. Um, we use Graston here, which is a little, can be a little scary for people, but this is a form of manual therapy. Um, the Graston technique, which is, um, I think feels really, really good, is um, this gets in and, and really does a lot of deep tissue work on muscles and specific muscle groups. We can use this to get in between the little um, joints to, if you have like some deep um, scar tissue in between the spine, in between the spines, we use that. Uh, this, this has been a, a big life, saves save, and it saves our hands, right? <laughs> so we can keep on working. <laughs> All right, so, so here again, here's the manual therapy techniques that um, are most commonly used are, would be joint mobilization. Joint mobilization is as um, we just do some glides to the joint in the spine. It would be little glides to the, to the joint itself. Soft tissue mobilization is just moving around the muscles and moving around any of the soft tissue capsule. Um, myofascial release is a, is a technique of releasing um, the soft tissue in your body that covers all the muscles. Uh, muscle energy techniques is one of my favorites. Muscle energy technique is when something is not quite in alignment in the spine. If something wasn't quite in alignment, we put you in a certain position, and then we ask you to do a little isometric. We, we apply a little bit of pressure, and you actually use your own muscles to pull yourself back into alignment. It's very gentle. And, um, and so people that are in a lot of pain, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't bother them at all, but we're able to bring you back into to normal alignment. Manual traction techniques are that we sometimes, with, with patients that distraction will sometimes relax your spine, so we'll do some leg pulls, or we have a belt that we'll um, put around someone's knees or legs, and we do a little bit of manual traction. Um, to provide some traction to relieve the disc of, of some, sometimes when you relieve the disc, if it's bulging, it will actually create a vacuum enough for it to come back in to where it needs to go and then decrease some of the swelling. And we talked about the Graston technique is right there. You have to be certified in some of these techniques, so um, have special certifications. So modalities. Modalities are physical therapy modalities, a type of physical agent um, that's used to produce a physiological change in the soft tissue or in your circulation. Um, they are used to relieve pain, improve circulation, decrease any swelling that you might have, reduce the muscle spasm, and, and then sometimes we even um, have used, we use a machine that can deliver certain types of medication, um, a cortisone type of medication, um, and other medications. Modalities are typically electrical, thermal, or mechanical en energy. Um, they're used primarily as supplements to manual therapy and exercise. I think they're kind of on a secondary, at least primarily in this clinic, we use them on a secondary or tertiary basis um, to the manual therapy and exercise. Uh, so here are some common modalities, and if you've had physical therapy before, then you would, you've seen some of this before. Ultrasound, which is a high frequency um, sound wave, which will produce, will, depending on if you use it on a continuous wave, sound wave, it will produce deep heat. On a pulsed wave, it will ha actually bounce off the tissues and it can bring in more circulation, decrease inflammation. Electrical stimulation we use to decrease pain, improve circulation. A TENS unit has been around forever. That helps to decrease pain and then decrease spasm. The iontophoresis and the phonophoresis, those are uh, ways of delivering medication. So if you have some scar tissue or inflammation like a bursitis, we, we use, um, the doctor writes a script for like a cortisone kind of medication that we put in a pad and the electricity will actually push it through to, to the area. We don't use that often on backs, but sometimes on bursitis and whatnot. Traction we talked about, moist heat, and here we do do, we have a cold laser, which is a laser, it's not hot, so you can't like, 
I still have my wrinkles. I can't, you know, change wrinkles or do anything like that. We can't blast out gallstones. But we do, um, cold laser does speed up your own body's recovery um, system. What it does is it uses the same things as sun rays, uh, infrared rays. And what it does is it moves around the cells. When you're injured, your cells kind of like slow down. And this will help when the, when the rays, when the light hits the area, it speeds up the rate of the cells and thus your own body's recovery system. So I, we actually use the laser quite a bit here. So we educate people in posture. There's some examples of posture. And is everybody going to sit up straight now? Um, so we do a lot of education on posture. We do a lot of education on body mechanics and how important it is. I know that for my back patients, lots of times I'll do, I'll give them information about how their workstation is, how they're sitting at their desk at home, uh, how they're driving. Like I, sometimes I'll even go out and look at their car because they drive for long periods of time and it's their car that's bothering them. Um, and then we do do, we do do an assessment of how they're standing because that will tell us a lot about what muscles may be tight uh, and what muscles may be weak just by looking at how someone stands. Here's some good sleeping postures. Um, it's, it, even when I lie my patients down in a treatment table, it's a pet peeve to me for them to be like out straight because that's a lot of pressure on your back. So not that many people sleep on their back, but it's always good to have that little bit of relief. And if you're going to sleep on your side, you want to sleep with a pillow between your knees. I know that sounds like it's hard to do, but if you picture that levels out your pelvis. If, if you're sleeping on your side without the pillow, then you're suddenly in kind of an uh, asymmetrical, kind of funky way your pelvis is. So, all right. Now the big question is, do I use ice? Do I use heat? I'm an ice queen. I'll tell you that right now. So if you were going to call here and say, can I speak to Terry? What should I use? I'm going to tell you the first thing I'm going to tell you to use ice. It, because it takes away inflammation. And honestly, in the back, most times, if you have um, a back, back pain, it's inflammation. And you want to start with ice first, OK? Because the ice, if it, it's really hard to get rid of any inflammation in your back. So the heat is going to heat it up. It's going to feel really good. I will admit it. it's going to feel really good on the muscles. But if you have any inflammation around the nerve root, heat is going to bring a lot of blood flow to the area. And then it's going to feel good while it's on. And then you know, a couple hours later, it's going to just come back. And it could come back more than, more than it was before. Um, we use it for about 20 minutes. Never ice, never direct contact with the skin. You want to put it in a pillowcase or something like that. Um, we use it for nerve pain. We use it for muscle spasm. It doesn't have to be acute pain. It can be chronic pain. Um, the heat, you know, you can use for the stiffness, achiness, um, and muscle spasm as well. Sometimes I'll tell my patients even um, that they can alternate the two. That works really well for muscle spasm. You put it on for tw each for 20 minutes. And then um, I usually tell them to end with like five minutes of ice at the end. Obviously, if any one of these makes someone worse, you should stop. I say that, but you'd be surprised how many people go, you know, I've been using the heat, and I don't know, or I've been using the ice, and I'm much worse. And you know, they, they need that OK, you can stop that. All right, so. That is a general kind of uh, idea of what we do for physical therapy. Obviously, there's uh, some more complex ways we deal with back pain. Um, physical therapy does help people um, with, with back pain. People with chronic, chronic issues with back pain, sometimes it, it has to be a combination of you with your doctor. You us and your doctor working together, whether it be with injections or not. But it, it can help 95% of the people with back pain. So I think um, at this point, um, we are going to do questions if anybody has questions. Kathy has a mic.
because tonight's lecture was being um, videotaped for, um, for the hospital website. And um, so in that way, if anybody, um, everybody can hear your question and the answer. So anybody have a question? Is most pain caused by inflammation of the muscles in your back? Is most pain. So most pain is not, it's not necessarily inflammation. It can be tightness. It can be, it can, I think that that is a general kind of idea. It's, most pain is caused by a muscle imbalance, I will say. So not necessarily inflammation, but a muscle imbalance, like tightness and uh, weakness and something that's you're, the out of balance. You mentioned the sciatica too. So would you see a neurologist? or what, what type of doctor would you go to if you're experiencing the back pain, not knowing if it's your nerve, your muscle, you know, et cetera? Mm -hmm. You can start with your primary care. Most primary cares now are very educated on um, back pain. Um, the, the other thing that people just um, aren't really uh, familiar with, and there's not a lot around, there's more coming uh, there's more coming into this area now as a physiatrist. Physiatrists are doctors of physical um, medicine, and um, they deal with a lot of chronic pain and, um, and back pain and, and whatnot. So I would probably start with your primary care first. Neurologist is, is definitely a, a, a choice. They deal mostly with the nerve pain. But if, you, if you're experiencing just general back pain and you're just not sure where you want to go, there are some orthopedics now that specialize in spine, just spine, that don't do surgery. They're really hard to find. I do know of a couple out in the Natick area that have um, just come to the area. So if someone you know, needed to know of any, that's the other thing is if you ever need to know of any specialty doctors and you're, you're confused about where you should go, Generally, we have a good idea about how to direct you to. You can always call us, but um, yeah, I would always start with your primary care first because they'll they'll do the first you know the first X-rays or whatnot, and generally they can send you where you need to go first. with the uh, herniated and ruptured discs had, I think, four items on it. Yes. And looking at the ruptured disc and the one below it, it made me wonder whether the pain that's associated with a ruptured disc is like sudden, like an explosion, or whether it, it continues. Well, they admit it can happen. It can happen that way. You can get that. Um, an injury, a sudden injury, but a lot of times with back, it's just the, that progression. It starts off as a bulging, herniated disc, and then can progress and break open over so, time. So it's cumulative. So when it breaks open, do you have a sudden burst of pain? Typically, you have a lot of inflammation, a lot of acute pain. And then it continues area. until you get treatment? Typically, you have a lot of trouble moving. Sometimes it brings people to the emergency room. Um, it is pretty acute. So I think, it, I think Cheryl, Cheryl's correct when she says that when the acuteness happens, and it depends on where the, the disc matter goes. So, the, you know, so if the disc matter, it, you, when you initially have a ruptured disc like this, right, if it, if it does this, sometimes people are just achy with these, you know, and they're achy and it comes and it goes. You know, and then when this occurs, and if it occurs acutely, they have that acute pain. There's times when this, if it's not sitting on a nerve root, after the acute pain occurs, if that disc matter isn't necessarily sitting on a nerve root, sometimes the inflammation will go away and the patient will have achiness and they will no longer have that acute pain, but they may have a low grade of, of, um, of back pain. 
the, the problem is that at any t one time, that disk matter can move again because now it's out, and it can move to, to sit on the nerve root. And that's when people get that gosh awful pain that lasts for so long, radiating um, and, and weakness and numbness and tingling that Cheryl talked about earlier. Um, Again, we're speaking in generalities. Every patient's a little different. I, and, and I'm sure Amanda and Cheryl can speak to this as well, I've seen some amazing things happen that we've had patients that have come through and we've gotten MRI reports and we're like, I can't believe this patient doesn't have more pain than they do. And then we've gotten, you know, other people that, you know, they have small bulges and they have a lot of pain. So. It depends on their body's response to the inflammation and, and where the disc actually has bulged or where the disc matter has decided to sell itself. True enough, as I said in my part, that conservative management really comes into play at the 6 to 12 week mark. You know, as soon as the patient, or even in the 3 week mark, as the patient is most acute and we can get that inflammation down and, and start to teach the patient different positions to rest, to ice, because when they haven't, don't have those, they don't have those techniques and they don't have those ways to manage it, then, then it just progresses and then the tightness settles in and, they're, and they start to compensate. Hi, I have two questions, if that's okay. Um, what exactly is the definition of arthritis and how it is on the um, spine and how does it affect you know, pain, and it, is it inflammation, or that is a, a loaded question. I know, that's a big question. Yeah, yeah, that's a loaded question, exactly. Um, so arthritic changes are typically, a lot of times it's genetic, so you have no control over your family genetics. Uh, if you're predisposition to it, you're predisposition to it. And it's degenerative changes, it's a wearing and tearing over time. Um, but, <laughs> to, as I had mentioned in my slide, you can get the disc disease starting ages of 35 to 45, same with arthritic changes. So it can start early, and it just depends on your job, you know, repetitive action, biomechanics, all those factors come into play. So it's really um, degeneration going on. So it's the bone. Typically, arthritis is bone. Um, and then stenosis, which you had mentioned earlier, is the narrowing. Um, the bone gets worn, and then that space between each vertebra gets less and less and less. And unfortunately, those are, you can't reverse those changes, but we can, we can affect the tension in the muscles if you're getting tight in that area, and we can strengthen, because there's, oh, you know, people start to compensate, and so they shift away from the pain, or they shift towards their pain to, to compensate, and so then you get that asymmetry that Terry was talking about, and that's where we come into play and try to um, strengthen you guys and, and get you symmetrical to decrease the forces, decrease the wear and tear, slow down the progression of the degenerative changes. Did you have another question? Yeah. <laughs> Does the disc matter ever replace itself once it leaks out, or is it just not there anymore? Yeah, once it leaks out, oh, it's, it's gone. It's gone. <laughs> Actually, one other question, yeah, yeah. if that's all right. Yeah. I don't know if anybody. Um, if you have an uneven leg, like your legs aren't even, how does that affect the spine? That's that asymmetry that, um, that I was talking about. So we, we look for that as part of our assessment. Um, so there's a true leg length discrepancy, and then there's a functional leg length discrepancy. So a true leg length discrepancy, once again, genetics. Sometimes people, like their femur bone, their, their leg bone, their thigh bones, they actually just one shorter than the other, or it can be in the lower part of the leg. So we, we'll assess whether it's true. And there's not a whole lot except putting like heel lifts in or changing the shoe height kind of thing. Um, but a functional leg length is, is t more typical, and that's when, when we do test you, we get you in a non-gravity position. And, um, and then we can see that you're actually level when we take away gravity and you're not shifting a certain way. And it's usually that asymmetry again. And so we'll work on stretching and making things symmetrical so that those forces are more evened out. That's sort of helped that area, but my neck 
was um, like leaning down in the table, and then that made my cervical mm -hmm. uh, neck worse. So I <laughs> fixed one thing, and then and it, that and that's the uh, that's yeah. kind of the caveat there is sometimes people learn to live with their issues, <laughs> and yeah. so sometimes when you when we go and change things, it changes other things. Right. So you kind of have to be careful and, and yeah. pick kind of the lesser of two evils, you know. If, it, yeah. if it's a little bit of a leg discrepancy where we can do, work on stretching and strengthening to even you out more and decrease the forces, that's the route we'd rather that's go. Right. Yeah. So that concludes our lecture for tonight. And thank you very much. Thank you.